Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the 40th anniversary Army Band Tuba Euphonium Workshop. Uh, first full day, and we are excited to have as, uh, as awesome of a crowd as we've had so far today. Just a few announcements before we get into the program here. Um, if you, you've probably heard this a bunch of times, if you have any questions about um, what's going on, what the schedule is, make sure you check out usarmyband.com. The whole program is online there. Um, also, the first AFT, that's the Armed Forces Tuba Euphonium Ensemble rehearsal, is um, tonight, and it's 6 p.m. to 7.30, and it's right here. So if you're going to take part in that, just be sure to, to try to make it to that rehearsal. And also, the exhibit's open tomorrow at noon, and they'll be open tomorrow, uh, Friday, from 12 to 5.30, and on Saturday from 10 to 5.30. Um, and if you guys can help us out, and please register on the link, uh, the Eventbrite link that was sent out. Uh, if you have any questions about that, grab one of the committee members. We can help you out with that. That really helps us to, um, to get capture the numbers and to get uh, information that helps us to continue to do this each and every year. Um, so if you could do us a favor with that, that would be much appreciated. And uh, last thing is, there's a couple of uh, cool things over on our Instagram channel, so go check that out. Um, that's you know relative to the tube euphonium workshop. Our public affairs office has actually made up a, a fun little trivia uh, quiz, and uh, it might be fun to see how well you know the workshop uh, and the history of the workshop. I know we see some folks each and every year who've been here for 20 plus times, and uh, and just you know check out check out your knowledge and, and test it out there. Uh, well. It's always fun to be able to work with uh, some of our colleagues in the National Capital Region here, uh, fellow military musicians, and um, we get the privilege in this recital to work with our friends up at the Army Field Band. And before I introduce them, I want to, uh, she's playing on the second piece, but I want to really highlight uh, the accompanist that's going to be playing on, um, on the second piece with Patrick Nyron. Um, we originally had a couple of accompanists lined up for this, and unfortunately, one of them had an injury um, early in the week, and so we kind of had to, the, the committee did a great job of scrambling, getting, uh, getting replacements for those great accompanists, and this is one of them, and uh, we've had nothing but glowing reviews from people that have performed with her and rehearsed with her so far. So um, I just want to highlight Ina Blevins, and, uh, and thank her for her contribution in uh, helping to make this workshop possible this week. So without further ado, uh, please welcome the tuba and euphonium section of the United States Army Field Band. Thank <laughs> you. 
I'm Staff Sergeant Patrick Nyron. I uh, play euphonium in the concert band of the United States Army Field Band, and we're really thrilled and really happy to be here. Thank you so much to Master Sergeant Lassard and the United States Army Band Pershing Zone for extending this invitation to come and play for you. Uh, we have a wide variety of music today that uh, provides some chamber music and a couple of solo features. Uh, the first piece was Ludus by Václav Nelibel for a tuba trio. And next, I'd like to perform a solo piece for the euphonium. It's Bert Appermont's The Green Hill. And as Master Sergeant Lassard mentioned before, we have a wonderful pianist. She is truly fantastic and a wonderful collaborator. So I think she'll really bring this piece to life. Please help me welcome pianist Ina Blevins.
Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here. I am Sergeant First Class Scott Devereaux. I am one of the tuba players in the Army Field Band, and I just wanted to talk while they're switching the stage over a little bit about the next piece you're going to hear. It's a piece that's uh, very near and dear to my heart. I was um, 
asked to premiere this work uh, way back in 2018, and I had signed on to premiere the work at the Newburyport Chamber Music Festival in 2020. And I'm sure that you can guess what happened to the 2020 version of the Newburyport Chamber Music Festival. Did not happen. So <clears throat> I actually premiered this work in 2021 at the Newburyport Chamber Music Festival, which is a small town, um, not, it's a new, new England city just north of Boston, right where the Merrimack River lets into the Atlantic Ocean. It's a beautiful, beautiful um, New England town. And um, I have not yet mentioned that uh, the composer for this work was uh, Erica Wazen. And I, so immediately when I was asked to do the premiere, I was obviously very excited, uh, Wazen being a very illustrious composer and one that I admired greatly. Um, lucky for us, uh, Mr. Wazen is actually uh, here with us today. He came down from New York City to hear this performance as it only the second performance of this piece and the first one outside of Newburyport, Massachusetts. So I'd like to uh, quickly recognize Mr. Mr. Wazen here in the audience. <laughs> and uh, thank him for what I truly believe is a great contribution to the, um, to the tuba repertoire. Um, before I talk a little bit about the piece, I do want to welcome my uh, wonderful collaborators the, um, here at Pershing's Own. They were really um, willing to uh, support this performance and um, let me collaborate with the uh, Army Band String Quartet, so please welcome them. So it's been an absolute joy to work with them on this piece. Uh, like I said, it's only the second time it's ever been performed. So the work, uh, I, in my opinion, is very much based on the uh, place and time in which it was written. So it's uh, uh, titled the Newberry Sonata or the Newberry Quintet. And it is Newberry's port, Massachusetts, which um, serves as the kind of muse for the work. And I think in the first movement, you definitely hear a lot of the energy. Obviously, the community is centered around the water, centered around the ri Merrimack River and the Atlantic Ocean. And the first movement, you're really going to feel that energy. And secondly, it's a piece of the time in which it was written, and that it was written during the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And the second and third movements um, the second movement especially is a beautiful, beautiful um, tribute to what was um, maybe lost during that time. And the third movement uh, is really about capturing an energy towards uh, keeping going, persevering with, with kind of a great energy towards um, whatever our new normal is. So uh, without further ado, I'm really excited to present for you the Newberry Quintet by Erica Wazen.
Thank you all. Um, that was absolute joy, and thanks, thanks to Mr. Wazen again. That was um, really a joy to play for you. Um, sorry, I had to run off stage to get my page turner here for the next piece. But uh, next, uh, we're going to welcome actually the full uh, field band section, um, plus uh, one former member who now works in uh, admin for the unit. So um, if you And uh, so if you would, please welcome to the stage the United States Army Field Band conical low brass section. <laughs>
Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Uh, again, we are the United States Army Field Band, Tuba and Euphonium section, and I hope I provided a wonderful example on how to not skip lines. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. So thank you for being here. Thanks to our friends and colleagues at the United States Army Band Pershing Zone for extending this invitation to us. Um, I'm truly honored and blessed to be in the best low brass section in the National Capital Region. That's right! <laughs> we have fun. So again, thank you for being here. Our last piece is uh, Ignition by Kevin Day. Hope you enjoy and hope you stick around for more great music for the rest of the weekend. Thank you.
Good afternoon. Thank you. It's good to see a lot of the same faces from this morning. I hope you guys are having a great time. Uh, it's really nice being back after three years of a hiatus, so um, I'm really glad to see so many happy faces. Um, like the last uh, recital I announced for, I'd like to start with a few announcements. Um, if you don't already know, our program is online. Uh, you can visit U.S. Army Band and then go through the channels to find the workshop page, or you can just scan the QR codes that I think are on the stands back there in, in a few places around the building. Um, also, while you're on our website, if you wouldn't mind, if you haven't already, registering for this event, it's not necessarily just to have access. You guys are clearly already here. Um, it's mostly to keep you updated with you know, performances, concerts around the constantly through the year. Uh, for example, um, we have a trombone workshop of the similar structure in March. So for all you low brass enthusiasts, um, definitely check that out too. I don't play much trombone except for when I read in the reading session, and it's really fun. Um, so go ahead and check that out uh, while you're on our website. Um, for all of our uh, current active duty um, military euphonium and tuba players, if you haven't already or um, don't have it planned, uh, we, AFT is back, A-F-T-E-E, -E, Armed Forces Tuba Euphonium Ensemble. Um, it's a mass group, everyone's welcome if you're active duty, and uh, you just have to simply show up at 6 p.m. tonight uh, in, this, in this room. That's our first rehearsal. Um, exhibits, that's another hot topic. That's actually open tomorrow, if you haven't already heard, uh, from 12 to 5.30, and again on Saturday from 10 to 5.30. Uh, so check it out, a lot of good stuff happening over there. And the last thing I'll say as a house announcement is uh, Instagram. If you see something that you like, you know, oh, I love this piece or this little snag, I'm going to put on my Instagram. Go ahead and tag at U.S. Army Band, and we will go ahead and put that up on our stories. Um, we'll we'll refeature it. Um, we can't really do that without the tag, so that's pretty important. And then the other thing is, if you haven't already done it, there is a cool tuba euphonium. Cool, as cool as it can be. Um, quiz, <laughs> it's, it's pretty neat. I think they did a great job with it. So go ahead and check that out. It's in our stories. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to um, welcome uh, a Virginia native. Actually, he grew up coming to this workshop, um, not too far from Fort Myer. So it's really cool that we're having people come back as the guest artist, um, kind of full circle. Uh, this this workshop, and this is one of the questions on the, the quiz, so I'm giving it away. This has been around for 40 years, so it's really neat to see it kind of bring on a whole new life. Um, and uh, yeah, so please, let's welcome um, Dr. Brandon Smith from Valdosta State University and his lovely accompanist, Myla Gutierrez-Springfield. Well, I was just up here with the uh, tube euphonium ensemble, so it's, I would say it's nice to be back, but I never really left. <laughs> um, uh, this first piece that we're going to play is uh, by an Australian composer named Andrew Batterham. And I first heard this piece at uh, iTech 2019, and I th think it was Tim Busby's recital. And uh, essentially, this piece is a reflection of a composer's uh, experience after he left the house that he grew up in for the final time, which is a very, very deep thing to think about. And um, I think we all have maybe moments in our life where we think about uh, places that we've been, and when that nostalgia hits you, there's a feeling. And I think that this piece tries to capture that. So if, uh, if, if that doesn't work for you, or you think like, no, that's, that's not really what I'm interested in, it's a great F-tuba piece, and it's about five minutes long. So uh, we hope you enjoy it. This is Old House by Andrew Batterham. <clears throat>
Isn't that a nice little piece? Yeah, it's nice. I really like that one. Um, well, now that you're in the door, uh, I'm going to play two concertos. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. So anyway, uh, the, first, <laughs> the first piece that I'm going to play uh, after that is, is a piece called Landscapes. And this was written by a friend of mine that, we, uh, that I met at FSU when I was doing my doctoral work. And his name is Ian McCollum, and he teaches at UNC Charlotte. And uh, he wrote this really uh, great piece for another friend in the studio, Harrison Brown, over their shared love of uh, national parks. And so um, Ian is a very reflective person, a very deep guy. If you can have a really long conversation with him in just about anything. And he wrote this as a, a reflection on his love of the national parks, but also a little bit of his feeling of insignificance or despair over the fact that we're losing those things, right? Climate change, um, maybe just not protecting our environments in general. But then he also wrote it for contrabass tuba 
because he liked the idea of describing these massive landscapes with an instrument that was capable of dynamic extremes, range extremes, and um, and he definitely he definitely asks for a lot of extremes. So this is a piece that I hope, if you're hearing it for the first time, which many of you are likely to be hearing it for the first time, that you consider using this on your recitals, maybe giving it to some students. I think that these movements stand alone as good pieces of music, but the work as, as a whole, I think, could could definitely join the canon of our repertoire. So I'm going to do a little tuba change here, and and this is. Um, uh, landscapes by Ian McCullum. First movement is Grand Teton um, uh, National Park. The second movement is Grand Canyon, Grand Canyon Run. Third movement is Smoky Mountain Lament, which is probably my favorite movement. And then the fourth movement is Redwood Spires. So I, I hope you enjoy this piece.
piece and you want to play it, you can contact Ian McCollum. I really should have brought his email address or something, but I can give it to you afterward if you want to catch me. Um, the last piece on the program is uh, also another fairly new work. This is uh, Tuba Concerto by Jennifer Higdon. And uh, I think most of us know who Jennifer Higdon is, but if you don't, she's a really celebrated composer. She was on faculty at the Curtis Institute of Music, and her works are played by every major orchestra. And when I first heard this, uh, it was uh, on an NPR archive from a concert that had happened maybe three months prior, and it was Craig Knox with the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Symphony, and I was uh, really uh, charmed by the piece. Uh, this piece is in three movements. The outer movements are quintessential Higdon, 
unbelievable energy, crazy runs, um, a lot of fun. And the middle movement is a little bit more abstract. Uh, there's less to hang on to, so I, I try to do a good job uh, not keeping you uh, bored <laughs> during that second movement, but it can be a little bit long, um, but it goes out with a bang. So uh, I, I hope you enjoy this concerto. This is Tuba Concerto by Jennifer Higdon. I just want to say thank you again to the Pershing Zone. Uh, this com conference was a big part of my education growing up, and it is fantastic that it's still happening. Um, I'd also like to say thank you to my wonderful, wonderful collaborative artist, Myla Springfield. <laughs> we are really lucky to have her at VSU, so thank you for coming, Myla. Um, yeah, and that's it. Okay, Tuba Concerto by Jennifer Higdon. Come talk to me afterward. I like meeting new people. I said that earlier, and I meant it. Thanks.
Thank <laughs> you. 
Hey. Good afternoon. Welcome. Uh, I have a couple of announcements that you might have heard already today, but all of our programs are on usarmyband.com. You can get there by going to usarmyband.com or scanning the QR code at the front of the uh, hall here. Uh, you can also read about all of our guest artists if you're interested. Uh, there's, especially with, with uh, this guy I'm about to introduce, a lot to read and a lot of cool stuff. So um, first, Armed Forces tuba euphonium rehearsal is tonight at 6 p.m. in this room. If you are planning to participate in that, please be here at 6. Uh, exhibits open tomorrow at 12 and Saturday at 10. They're both open to 5.30 on both days. Uh, so go check out some cool stuff. Um, also on our website, you would see a registration link. If you have not registered through that link, please do so. That helps us keep track of how many people we have. and. It uh, helps us to justify doing what we do here. So uh, I would appreciate it if you would register, please. Um, OK, so this is uh, Bill Muter and the Modern Tuba. Welcome, Bill. Check, check, check. What's up, everybody? All right, I thank you all for coming here. It's cool to see all these tubas. Um, I have to admit, I normally don't come to these things because I live kind of in the fringes of the tuba world um, where, you know, as a tuba player, if I get called for a gig, I'm the only one. Well, first off, as a tuba player, I don't get called for a gig because <laughs> there aren't. No, let's be real, there's no gigs out there. So I get called to get for a gig as a bass player. Um, so I, I have kind of identity crisis as a tuba player. I'm really a bassist that identifies as a tuba player, um, which can be confusing for people. Sometimes I'll get called for a gig and I'll... I'll bring the bass, but I'll also have my tuba like packed in the side. I'm like, just trust me, it'll be cool. Like it'll, it'll, it, it'll be good. Um, and I've been trying to kind of sneak in the tuba as as much as I can. So today, I just want to talk about that a little bit. We're gonna play. Um, uh, first off, just big thanks for for Alex Ryder for getting me involved in this thing and inviting me out here. For Toby for answering like 20 of my emails. Back and forth. Usually I do this within like a two hour thing and sometimes within multiple days. And um, we have like 45 minutes or less, so we're gonna, we're gonna hit it and make it fun. So uh, admittedly, I'm not gonna be able to cover all the things today, but I wanna get to some of the important parts. And usually I do this with, with my, my band and musicians that I play with. And when coming up here, it just wasn't in the cards, wasn't in the budget to fly. I'm from Miami, South Florida. So it wasn't in the cards to fly everybody up. And I don't think anybody in Miami wants to deal with the cold weather right now anyways. So I was like, hey, can we get some musicians? And uh, he's like, yeah, is it okay if we had some, some guys from the Army Blues? I was like, oh, heck yeah, man, that's, that's, dope. that's dope. Yeah, perfect. So uh, the fun thing about this, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm reading names, because we just met like 10 minutes ago, by the way. We've never played together before, so this is, you're gonna see something fun. Um, this is James Collin on piano. Get her for James. We have Eric Purs on drums and Aaron Eckert on euphonium, but also plays trombone, and he brought the youth today, which is dope. So. I will memorize names, but yeah, so this is going to be a fun time. We're going to play a little bit. Um, I'm going to have you all play, and we're just we're going to have be laid back, have a good time. There's some things up here. Uh, it's not clinic materials. You don't need it for the thing. We're, we're going to do all this on the fly today, uh, purely improvisational. Um, I'm not sure, we're, they don't even know what we're doing, so it's, it's gonna be fun, but feel free to grab a flyer afterwards. I have a course online called The Modern Tuba, so if there's anything that we don't cover today, go check it out. A lot of really great people are involved in that as well, guys like Scott Sutherland, um, Tuba Red, all diff there's, there's like 10, 15 different tuba players that are involved, good friends of mine that kind of helped out uh, to lend a little bit to that course. So anyways, this is, uh, yeah, let's play a little bit, shall we? And then um, everyone can take a couple choruses and play. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
told I should talk into the microphone because live stream. What's up everybody live streaming? My wife should be watching right now, my friends at home, I hope you're watching, my parents. Um, yeah, that was fun. So that was the first time we played together. And uh, as a tuba player, um, coming up, coming out of high school, I had a really bad guidance counselor that told me, what do you, you asked me what I want to do for my career. I was like, I don't know, I like music. I want to do something in music. And um, so my guidance counselor said, well, you know, if you're a good player, you should go for tuba performance. And if you're not a good player, you should go for music education. <laughs> I was like, that's terrible advice. Like, if you're not good at music, you should go teach other people to do music. That would be a really good plan. I'm like, I, I, don't, I don't know. So I, I found, I, I went to college for a bit, and um, I found myself in this, this rut where I realized that I was never going to win an audition against anybody in a room like this. There's no way. And that, I, my thoughts confirmed that when I got here and I was listening to everybody play today. I was like, you all could play me under the bag. So there's no way I was ever going to be that person in one audition. And when I was younger, I, I just, it was like a real identity crisis for myself, trying to figure out like what my path would be as a tuba player. Um, and so I was, I played in the show early on in my career, the show Blast, um, with a buddy of mine, Jeff Harrigan, who's here as well today. What's up, Jeff? So we were, I was a tour with that group off and on for about five years. And when you're, when you're touring, as a musician, when you're touring, your goal is to kind of stay on the road because that's how you make money. You're not making any money when you're off. And um, so I was touring for about you know, five years or so off and on. And in between contracts, say I may be on the road for six to eight months, and then I have a layoff for like two weeks. So I would try to hustle and, and get gigs. My goal was I don't want to be a barista. Like, I don't want to work, nothing against that, but I'm like, I got to do something in music. I don't know what it is. So I would take these random gigs um, as much as I could and, and just trying to play things. And, but I put this like APB out to all my friends. I'm like, hey, if you know anybody looking for a tuba player, give me a call. And uh, again, nobody was looking for a tuba player. But one day, a friend of mine uh, by the name of Paula, she calls me up and she says, another person I, I, I was in blast with, she's like, I found this gig on Craigslist. And um, it's, they're looking for a tuba player. I'm like, come on, you're full of garbage. There's nobody like on Craigslist. And uh, lo and behold, so I called this number, and I'm, I'm thinking it's like one of my friends pranking me because I've been like posting all this stuff on time on Facebook, like, anybody need a tuba player? Anybody need it? Anybody? I'll work really cheap, <clears throat> free. Like, if anybody needs anybody. <laughs> so I, I, I call the number, and uh, this guy answers, and he said, um, we're, it's, it's this date. We need a tuba player. It's for a big band. We're playing at this club, Bongos, which is Gloria Stefan's club. I can't say who it's for, but it's a private party. We need a tuba player um, to play the bass stuff because it's kind of like a trad jazz feel. I was like, yeah, I'm like, you know, what's, what's the music? He's like, you're just going to read a bunch of char sound. How is your reading ability? I was like, cool, I can read. I felt good, like as a tuba player, I can, I can read stuff. And I, at that time, I was like in my prime. I thought I was in my prime as a tuba player because I was on the road a lot. And when we were in Japan, we'd hang out with like, a well, more B-list celebrities, and you know, you think like the show we were in was the number one grossing Broadway show in Japan at the time. So we felt like rock stars. And then I come back to the states and be like, yeah, I was in the show Blast, and everybody's like, what? What's Blast? I've never, never heard of that before. So I had this false sense of uh, security. And so, anyways, I took this gig, and there was no rehearsal, nothing. It's kind of like today. And I showed up, um, and I remember getting there, and they handed me the music. And as, as a tuba player, I'm looking at it, I'm like, Where, where's the sheet music? And there was no sheet music. It was just a, a chord chart with just slashes and you know, nothing notated out. And I, uh, I kind of almost figuratively and almost literally crapped the bed uh, on that gig because I had no idea what I was doing. I knew I can read, my reading skills are strong, but I, didn't, I couldn't hang. And um, so I, if it said like, E flat, major seven, sharp 11. I was like, okay, I'm, I don't know what all that is. is I'm going to play E flat right here. And if it said B flat, da, 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 I'm like, I'm going to play a B flat right here. That's, that, I'm going to play what I know. And luckily, it was kind of a trad jazz thing. So if you stayed around the root in the fifth, you were good for most of it. Um, but it was, it was an awful, humbling experience. And that day, I went back and, and I'm like, you know what? It, I feel like everybody needs one of those gigs that like, keeps them real honest. 
to like just chop them down. Like you think you're hot stuff and then like all of a sudden you show up and, and uh, it knocks you out. And that gig absolutely knocked me out. And um, uh, so yeah, and, it, and by the way, it was a party for Gloria Stefan's daughter's quinceanera. These are, these are the kind of gigs you get when you live in Miami. So, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was the biggest bowl of paella I have ever seen. It was a huge bowl of paella. It was, it was a really weird time. But I, I, at, at that moment, I decided I needed to figure out how to do this. And I wanted to be better as a tuba player. And I knew that like, gave me the itch to want to play that type of music, even though I didn't know how to play it. So I started working as a bassist, and I figured, you know, Nobody in the area at the time was teaching the things that I wanted to learn on tuba. So I went to bass, because I wanted to play bass. And I started gigging as a bassist and started working myself up and playing, playing more gigs. And eventually, I started getting called by people that I really admire and people that I look up to. And about 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20. like five years ago, I got the opportunity to, um, I, I won an audition with the State Department as part of their Jazz Ambassadors program. So the Jazz Ambassadors program is a thing that started back in the 50s with Louis Armstrong, Dizzy Gillespie. And basically, our, our government wanted to show that, like, hey, you know what? We're a good country. Like, like we're, we're cool, like, like us. So they would send jazz musicians out to different countries to do cultural diplomacy and, and spread great music all over the place. And uh, the program still exists today. And I was fortunate enough to do that. And I really wanted to get into tuba. And a, a couple gigs before that, like I said, I was kind of sneaking in the tuba. And that was the first time that I asked, I'm like, you know, could I bring the tube on the gig instead of a bass, which is way more to travel with, as most of you know. Uh, and they're like, yeah, everything's paid for. It's covered. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm in tuba now. And then that was a, the moment where I, I, I kind of never looked back. And, um, but ultimately, when people call me, they don't call me to be a tuba player. They call me to be a bassist. Um, I got a call. I'm actually, after uh, this, I fly down Saturday to play a ground up fest with a bunch of the guys from Snarky Puppy and Sean Martin. And I play it every year as his go-go show. And it's like a who's who of musicians. And I remember the first time I played it, I played it on bass. And like out in the audience, there's Michael League, Esperanza Spaulding, like Mono Neon was there, all these people. And I'm like, dude, why am I playing bass right now? Like, can you please? I'm like, I'm having a heart attack. I'm like, this is, this is really uh, embarrassing. And that was like one of the turning moments where I, was, I realized like, I'm not gonna be a, a bass player. Like the, I'm gonna be a tuba player because I'm gonna just stick to my realm. That's like my X factor. And I've realized that it is, a, once I made that decision that I'm like, I'm gonna stick to this thing on tuba, it's opened up so many doors for me because I feel like as a tuba player, sometimes there's this like scarcity mindset of there's no gigs out there. And yes, you could think of that. There are no gigs out there, but um, there's, there's, I'll tell you, there's a, a parable of two shoe salesmen. Sorry, I like to talk. There's a parable of two shoe salesmen, and one they were hired from a company to go off to uh, a foreign country to assess the market for shoes. And one shoe salesman goes out, and he goes there, and he's like, "Man, it's a poor country. They don't have much. That no, you know, nobody's wearing shoes." So he reports back after a couple of weeks, sends a letter. He's like, "Hey, we we shouldn't do anything in this country. There's there's no market here. Nobody has shoes." And the other salesman reports back after a couple weeks. He says, hey, this is great. Nobody wears shoes. There's all opportunity here. And, and as a tuba player, I always think about that. Like, this, this is my way to, to separate. I need, I need a barrier to separate myself from everybody in this room because you all are amazing players. So I'm like, I try to just find my little niche where I can, I can do my thing. But it's allowed me to open up to a lot more opportunities um, and, and sneak in the tuba as much as I can. So anyways. Um, I want to play a little bit, uh, and I want to talk about how a bass player decides what lines to play. Anybody know what song we played? Olio. Olio, yeah. So um, if you're playing bass, what, do you, what are you thinking about what, in terms of how, what notes you play? One, three, five. What was that? One, three, five. One, three, five. Cool. Yeah. What else? That's good. Rhythm. Rhythm. Yeah, I like rhythm. Anything else? Yeah, so there's, there's, depending on the style of the music, you know, there's different things we lock into. You know, if we're swinging, I'm really locking in, like trying to glue to the ride as much as I can. If we're playing funk, I'm listening to the kick drum as much as I can. But all that stuff, I try, I don't want to think about it. Um, my goal is to, to learn the things and learn the theory as much as I can, so I don't, I don't want to have to be up here and thinking about all those things. So I, I want to share with you what I think about when I'm playing uh, 
for me personally, and this may not be anybody else, but for me personally, what I think about when I'm playing um, a bass or, or tuba. So the interesting thing about this instrument is we have the ability to influence the ensemble a lot more than we think. We think it's all the piano player, right? Because the piano player, the piano player is usually the best player in the room a lot of times. A lot of times, at least the gigs that I'm on, and I'm not knocking anybody here. They're all, these are all phenomenal musicians, but a lot of the gigs that I'm on, they're usually the MD because they know everybody's part, they know all the harmony, they know everything going on. But the cool thing about playing bass is you get to ultimately decide a lot of the qualities of the chords that you're playing. So I'll give you an example. Um, let's just play just a B flat major seven. We'll play it together. Two, ready. Cool. So what chord is? Check, check, check. Check, check, check. So what chord was that? B flat major seven. Okay. Now I'm gonna have them play the same chord. I'm gonna change my notes. Now, does anybody know, any music nerds know what chord that was? So, thank you, Sebastian. Sebastian was one of my students at a high school down in South Florida. He goes to Florida State now. Brilliant musician. Um, that is a G minor nine, okay? So he played the same thing. So we have one chord that is B flat major that feels happy, and you know we think of major being a happy thing, and then we think of minor being more sad. Let's just do the same thing. Anybody know that? So it, now we're in, we have this nice little sharp 11 in there, E flat major. So that we get a, a brighter major chord. But my point is, any time a piano player may play a note, and the note is always undecided until I decide, or the bass player decides, what he wants to do with the note. And that harmony is what really influences the ensemble in terms of sound. And this is universal, by the way. This, this is you know, agreed upon motions no matter where you go. So I'm gonna try something. Um, we're gonna play, can I have, anybody wanna come up and play a couple things? We're just gonna do giant steps on all keys. So if anybody's interested. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, any, any two, like a few two players wanna come up and play? We're just gonna play like three notes, so it's really not that deep. So, come on up, come on up, come on up. Yeah, yeah, let's do it. Okay, I'm gonna explain to them what we're doing. Uh, so I'm gonna give, so we're gonna have B flat. Uh, if, if we're gonna play a groove, we're just gonna. I'll explain to everybody so you can hear what's going on. So we're gonna play a groove. We're just gonna get boom, boom, boom. And I'm gonna have them play um, a couple different notes. And we're gonna move around with this. So if I go like this, this is sign language for B. I took sign language in high school because I was bad at Spanish, which is not a good play in South Florida. Um, so this is B, so if I do this, play a B flat. Um, G, so if I do this, play a G. And if I do this, play a C. So we'll just stay on B flat. Boom. So let's do this, and then lock in, like we were talking about, lock in with a kick drum. And let's just stay just octave B flats. Let's try it. And, and one, two, uh, uh, and. Now, so this is, our, this is our home base. So anytime you hear this, we're all playing the root note. Great decision as a tuba player. That's all I did on that Gloria Stefan gig, just root note. So anytime you hear this, I'm gonna ask everybody else who isn't playing to just go like this. This is our home. Let me see this. Everybody go like this. Home. Boom. All right, let's try it. One, two, ready, and. And good. Now. This, this, or this, stay on B flat major. If I go like this, just go back to the octave B flats. Okay? So now the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our major tonality. So let's do that same thing but on B flat, but B flat major this time. Okay? One, two, and ready. And. Now, so that's happy. When you hear happy, everybody go like this. 
Happy. Yes, happy, smiling faces. Everybody has to smile. So we're going to start with this. And then I'm going to give them a, a cue, totally subtle cue. And I'm going to go like this, and they're going to change the happy. So when you hear home base, go to home base. When you hear happy, go to happy. Let's try it. Start at home. One, two, ready. <laughs> Thank you. Now, now let's change it up. So we're going to go to, to G minor. So minor chord is typically, you know, a minor chord would be more sad. So everybody go like this. This is sad. Sad face. It's fun. Yeah. I love this. All right. So let's hear sad. Let's start right on that, that G minor nine. One, two, ready. what I felt like when I got here and I heard like the first tuba ensemble and my stomach started bubbling. I was like, oh, oh, I'm in the wrong place. I'm sad. So that's our sad emotion. Okay. And so for set, we have home base, we have happy, we have sad. And I'm going to do one more, which is longing. Okay. So stay on that. Let me have you guys play a C this time. Here we go. One, two, ready. And. So longing, everybody go like this. Yes, we're longing to be great tuba players, longing to be great bass players. Boom. Okay, so here's the pop quiz. We're going to put this all together. So we're going to start, and I'm going to give them some cues. And when they switch, it's your job to show me either home base, happy, or sad, or longing. All right, let's try it. This is very difficult. It's very, very difficult. Stick, stick with me here. All right, here we go. Home base. One. Two, ready. Right, it's okay, it's okay. You can express your emotions in here. This is a, this is a, a stress-free environment. Beautiful. Give yourself, everybody take your right hand, bring it around, pat yourself on the back. Very good. So the, the interesting thing is a couple of things. Thank you, guys. Um, you can have a seat. Yeah. <laughs> but for real, we're going to do giant steps next. Um, <laughs> so what's interesting about this is the piano, except for when we were in home base, the piano played the same chord every single time. He was just staying on B flat major. But the tonality changed because the bass changed notes. And what's cool about this, when I was on tour with the State Department, we did um, my last gig, we went through all throughout Mexico, and we went into, it was actually a really interesting tour. We would be in a university one day, and then we were working with kids in Tepito another day. And it was just, you know, we, 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 but my point is we would do this exact same demonstration. And no matter we were there or we were in Costa Rica, no matter what country we were in, everybody got the same results. So this is kind of like a no-brainer for an audience like this. We're all trained musicians. But my point is it, it transcends beyond that because music is a universal language that, you know, no matter where we went, if we were in Mexico, I, I don't speak Spanish, which is I, I slacked in high school. I, I constantly regret that. But... We had a translator, and we do this whole same presentation with a translator, and everybody got it, all, all the way down to like the four-year-old kids, because we all hear the same thing, even though we speak a different language, but we all hear the same way. So as a bass player, first and foremost, um, that is really important. I try to make decisions based upon this. I try to learn as much of the theory as I can so I can forget the theory and not have to worry about that when I'm playing and just focus on what happens here. Um, a couple other things as, as a bass player, and we kind of knocked on that a, a little bit, is, is tone. So just a little bit about, I have a bass amp right now, which is totally overkill for this room. Um, but the reason I do it is because the tone 
I don't want people to think I'm playing tuba. Um, I did a tour maybe 10 years ago. I went to New Orleans with an accordion player. It was a tuba and accordion tour, and we dressed up and wore face paint and makeup, and it was a different time in my life. <laughs> but I met this, this guy in New Orleans, John Gross. He's a phenomenal tuba player, if, if you know him or don't know him. Um, and I kind of was picking his brain on what, what he does, because I heard him play with this ensemble, and I was like, it's amazing. He sounds like an upright bass. He does not sound like a tuba at all. And what the trick is, I learned from a lot of those guys, is I actually have, it's an Audix D6. It's a kick drum mic that goes all the way down into the throat of the bell. So for, uh, you know, recording tuba, it's the worst sounding thing that you can get. Like, you know, if anybody studies audio engineering, that's not how you want to mic an instrument. <laughs> Typically, I'd have it off the bell, a little bit off, off axis, and I don't usually record su sousaphone a lot if I'm stacking it because there's so much noise that comes off the bell anyways. But it's, it's, the whole point is to shove it down the bell, and then you have this mic that's made for kick drums that attenuates all the highs. So you just have this really raw sound. But if you think about, you know, uh, uh, like an electric bass, when you play it that's not plugged in, it's a real raw sound. There's not much there. And that's the idea, is just to kind of pick up this raw signal. And then I just run it right into a bass amp. I have a wireless thing, so I don't trip over myself, which I've done before. Um, and then I, I have a pedal board that I run it through, and I also have an octaver that I'll use sometimes, because I find that if I play in an octave higher, and I drop the octave pedal, I'll demonstrate real quick. Um, Yeah, it's a little hard to hear, um, but I will drop the octave to try to sound either like an electric bass or a lot of times when I'm playing, like this weekend, if I'm playing um, at this go-go show in Miami, I'm, I'm trying to sound like a synth bass a lot of times. So I'm listening to synth bass players or electric bass players or double bass, you know, anything from Ray Brown to James Jamerson. You know, as Roger Bobo says, you know, and, and every you know, great tuba player, you should always have an idea of what you want to sound like in your periphery at all times. And for me, oftentimes it's not tuba players, because I find that in terms of tone, the thing that tuba players do, and I'm, I'm guilty of this, is we almost overplay sometimes. And then that throws out the tone, and it makes it very obvious that it's tuba. So if I'm going... Let me take off the octave. That doesn't sound like, that sounds very obviously like a tuba. But, now if I change my articulation where I'm barely using any tongue, and I use the bass amp for, well, mainly because I'm lazy. <laughs> uh, and you know, when you're playing swing especially, you don't stop, and breathing is an issue. So I find that if I have an amp, I can, I can do the same thing that a lot of the guys in New Orleans do and just kind of get my sound to be right there and then I don't have to play anything over like a mezzo forte the whole time or mezzo piano. It allows me to be able to play longer lines and kind of fit within the ensemble. And usually when I'm playing I'm with the ensemble where everybody's mic'd up, I have a 10-piece a, a funk band called Topless in Tokyo, which is a story for another day. But there's, I have a book out there, if you're interested in reading it, called Topless in Tokyo. It's a, it's a very interesting story. Uh, but I won't share it. This is a family-friendly streaming event. Um, but uh, it's a big horn section. It's loud. And, and in that, that case, uh, I always have to run through a bass amp. So the tone, to me, tone and time are, are the most important things um, in terms of all that stuff. So um, before we move on, any questions? So I have other stuff on there to make it look like I use other things, but it's really, uh, here's the problem when you bring out a pedal board. Every, every guitar player is, what you got there, man? What you got going on? And they're like, size you up by your, it's by your pedal board. So I, I have this set up for, I play, um, I play a lot of bass trumpet. 
So I have, if I'm playing bass trumpet and doing melody on that, I have it a, a little delay on there to just kind of sweeten the sound a little bit, but I never use it on tuba um, because it's just, it's muddy. Although I did try this hawker delay. Have you ever heard of that? There's this bassoon player who played with uh, Cirque du Soleil. Awesome bassoon player. And he does this hawker delay thing, and it's extremely difficult. I tried it on this, but it doesn't work. But I have a delay, I have an octaver, and I have uh, an envelope filter that allows me to get kind of a fatter tone. But it, to be honest, it doesn't sound great on tuba. So if I'm playing bass, this pedal board works for my bass, works for my tuba, and works for my bass trumpet. But the most important thing I actually have is a six-band EQ. Because most venues I get to, they see a tuba and have no idea what to do with it. Um, except for a, a thing like this. I played a gig uh, about three weeks ago, and it was a really, it was a really crappy gig. I did it, it was one of those for the money things. There was a, like a green market in my area. And I wanted to get my band together. And the only way that I can get them together to practice was to book a gig. I'm like, if everybody gets paid, I know everybody will show up. <laughs> so, so I booked this gig, and it was a four-hour thing at this green market. And I really wasn't expecting much. And the sound guy comes up. And here's the funny thing. He's like, and he's like oh, yeah, I play a little trombone. I was like, oh, that's nice, man. Yeah, cool. You know? And, you know, everybody's, it, musicians are weird. There's like a whole vibe thing of like, you know, to let you know, like, hey, I could play or I can't play or, you know, just try to assert yourself. But he's like, oh, yeah, I retired. I used to play trombone in the Army Blues. I'm like, oh, dope. <laughs> you know what you're doing. This is awesome. And uh, so I'm like, I need to get your number because anytime I have a gig, I need you to do sound for me. And it was like, the, it was the weirdest random gig at a, at a green market, but that was the best sound that I've had because he was just, he knew exactly what to do with it. And it was a good hang too because we just talked about music stuff the whole time. Um, any other questions? Yeah. What are kind of, uh, some of the, the scenes right now as far as doing modern tuba, like playing, I know, New York, LA, Miami? Yeah, so. The, what are the scenes? The, to me, I don't live in really like a music scene. Um, you know, they say, oh, you got to move to New York, you got to move to LA, and you know, there's there's a lot of credit to that um, of being close to the job that you want to get to, as physically close to the job. Um, but for me, I've been fortunate enough. A lot of my scene is is honestly through social media. Um, I've gotten a lot of gigs from just, and I, I it's one of those things I love and I hate. Like, if you see me post a lot of stuff on, on social media, it's actually me practicing. Because I'll do like a video of six tubas on there, and there's it's some of the best practice you could do of just laying yourself, and you realize, wow, that really out of tune, this is fun. And um, so that's, that's my practice, but every once in a while, I'll get something from that. Um, I actually got a film scoring gig from my Instagram page last year. This guy at Tyler Perry Studios in Atlanta, um, they were doing this film about a young euphonium player growing up in the Mississippi Delta that was like a rags to riches kind of thing, made it into music schools. It's the most random film, uh, but it's, it's really, really cool short film, and they needed someone to play the euphonium part. So he got on Insta, he's like, I don't know any euphonium players. He's kind of in the hip hop scene in Atlanta. He's like, I know some good trombone players, this, but he's like, I need a euphonium person. So he typed in hashtag euphonium on Instagram, and my profile came up, Tuba Visionary. And he saw one of the videos of someone I play with. He's like, oh, this must be the cat. So he called me. He's like, hey, I have this. I, would you be interested in playing on this film? I'm like, absolutely. And then he saw that I write a lot of marching band shows. He's like, oh, I heard some of your, your stuff that you do for marching band. Man, that's really good. Would you be interested in doing some writing for this? So since then, it's, it's on Amazon Prime. It was nominated for an NAACP award. And it was all these film festivals. And it was really cool. And it's, it's my first like Oscar, uh, Oscar qualifying film that I was a part of. Maybe the last two, but <laughs> but it was a fun experience, and I got it because the guy found me on Instagram. So my point is, like, I don't think you have to be in all the places to to do it. I think you just like it, now it's just consistency and just putting information out there. And you know, there's 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 people there's people here that are better. Like, is Natalie here? She's awesome, Natalie Colgrove. Like, if you follow her Instagram page. She's like super consistent. I'm I'm not as consistent, but there's random good things that'll come up from that that. To me, it's like a, a calling card of just like a landing page of like, here's some of the things that I've done, and if you like it, great. Um, but the market, everything that I do, I, I try to create every opportunity for myself because nobody's knocking down my door for, for tuba gigs. It just doesn't happen. And nobody's knocking down my door for bass gigs. Um, so I, every single thing that I do, I just have to create it. And that's, that's what it comes down to. But it's fun. I love doing it. And then I, I get to do it on my terms 
because if these guys called me and asked me to play, I would be so more nervous. I'd be like, oh my gosh, what, like Patrick Sheridan's playing with the Army Blues tonight. God bless him. I would be way more freaked out because like he's like this the full thing and now I, I could come in and be like, oh yeah, we're just going to play, we're just going to wing it and then kind of put them on the spot and it just, it takes the pressure off of me. So the, part of the beauty about booking your own gigs is you get to do whatever, I get to call the tunes. I get to call the stuff that I actually practice versus, you know, the other way around. So, any other questions? Cool. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. As far as like fitting in the pocket, you were talking about listening to like the uh, bass drum or the ride. Um, do you have any other uh, tips or tricks for like really making sure we're like locking in with, with what's going on around us? Because that, that's what's difficult for me is like really fitting in the pocket. Right? Um, yeah, it, it depends on the genre of music. I think the more every genre of music requires something completely different um, as, as a bass player. And, and the listening may be different. Um, to me, I try to just deep dive. Like my practice routine is just, usually I'll put on a, a concert and just force myself to play along with a concert, the whole thing. And I'm, I'm always been that practicer that I'll just, I'll close my eyes and just imagine being on stage with whoever I'm playing with, or like I put on whatever, YouTube video and just play along with it for, for hours and hours and just try to listen down to the intricacies of the music. But um, I think it's just listening. You know, music ultimately is a conversation. And what makes something like this difficult is we only talk for like three minutes ahead of time. We're like, hey, where are you from? Oh, I'm from here. I'm from this place. And it's hard. Like I've, I've, a lot of times when I play with a band, the first set is like, OK. And then the second set really hits, because you go backstage and like intermission, you come back and you had a conversation. And that conversation continues on stage. And I think, to me, the easiest way to groove is to be with people who support your ideas. Um, you know, I, I try to, I'm fortunate enough to play with some of my best friends in the world and people who I really love and admire. And they're the type of people that, if I make a mistake, they'll go with it. If I'm playing a wrong note, they'll be like, okay, cool. You know, this sax player I play with, Claudins, if, if, if I go way out and not mean to go out, he will go out with me and just make it a vibe and make it a journey and have fun with it. Um, so I, I think that is, one, playing with people that you, you know, really support you makes it easier to do that. And then also being in the room with people who are way better than you as many times as you can get, case in point, today. Um, and I, I always try to put myself in those scenarios where I'm just like the not the least talented person in the room because that's where I really get my butt kicked, and that's where I really, really, really start to grow. Um, let's play a little bit. Everybody who's got horn, we could do it in spot. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, we're just going to play some quarter notes on a B flat. I actually have a handout, but we're we're like low on time. So full full disclosure before before we leave, before we kind of wrap things up, um, I have a course online. It's a four week course, the Modern Tuba. There's some flyers out here to check it out. Uh, there's a lot of great names. I have Roland Simpali, uh, Ibanda Ruhumbika, awesome tuba player, Scott Sutherland, Tuba Red, Andrew Hitz, Reginald Chapman, Sergio Carolino, a lot of cats who are, did some guest spots on this as well for me. And we really dive in and talk about the actual theory. And what I try to do, everything is based around the blues on the course because to me, I, and I don't play a lot of straight ahead jazz. I play a lot of funk and R&B and hip hop. That's kind of the world I live in. But from a harmonic standpoint, to me, that's, it's, it's the best place to really get started and really get launched off. So we talk about bass lines starting from just root position, adding the fifth, adding the third, adding leading tones, chromatic lines. If you know your chromatic scale, it's the best scale you can know as a bass player because you can really do a lot as long as you're hitting the certain points that you need to hit. So we really dive into a lot of that stuff. And I have a handout, and if you're interested, you can come grab it. Although I printed out a Kinko's this morning. No, it's FedEx. It's not Kinko's anymore, right? Printed out a FedEx this morning, and they chopped off the last measure of every line. So you just have to guess for that measure when you get there. You'll play, and they just like kind of wing it, and then get on to the next thing. So um, most important thing, t tone, time. And let's, just, let's just play a little bit. So we're just going to let's just swing. We'll just stay around B flat. And then everybody, let's just play quarter note B flats. Just boom, ding, 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 ding. A one, two, a ready, and. Yeah. 
Yeah. And now imagine that that bass, like you have that that hit and that little bit of decay that happens. And try to give a little emphasis on tune four. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. And then, for me, I'm always, if I'm at that tempo, I'm trying to lay back. Like, I feel like sometimes it's more nice to be just like fashionably late to a party and just, just be a little bit behind. Like, that's where the, if you get too early to a party, you're helping set up the decorations and stuff. Where like, if you're, if you're there late, you could walk in and be like, oh, the food is already ready. So I try to just, it, it depends on the thing. Sometimes if, if you're really playing fast, you want to be on the, on the top end. This, I just try to lay back. Now, try this same time, but don't use any tongue. Just all air attacks. Let's see how that sounds. One, two, a red. Again. Yeah. So th that is. 90% of my practice is just sitting there locking in and just not using my tongue whatsoever. Because, you know, as you know, the air is, you, all you need is air to get your lips to respond. And oftentimes, if you over articulate, you don't sound like a bass player at all. You start to get that, that tuba sound back in the game. And I'll take, you know, you all familiar with like the, some of these practice apps like iReal Pro and stuff like that? If you just take a simple blues, and play, or you can go on YouTube and type in like B flat blues backing track, and just you can work on scales or anything, but just work on with no tongue whatsoever, air emphasis on the two and four, and start getting that style, and just and do it for a while, because I think as a tuba player playing bass, the longevity is so important to be able to just can you do that for four hours? <laughs> Seriously though, because that's like a lot of my gigs. All right, it's four hour hit or it's two hours, and as a as a tuba player, you don't stop playing. Right? If you're playing horn or trombone, you, you play your melody you, you know, in, in a combo setting, you step off and, and then you come back in solo and then you come back or whatever, but like, you never stop. So I think one of the greatest assets of just being able to, can you play for a, an extended period of time and just focus on the groove. A lot of times we want to move so fast to get into all the other stuff that's going on, but the tone, time, and feel, to me, are the most important things. So um, I have uh, my hand out here and I have another thing that goes through a progression. I'll just talk through it so you all know what it is. Um, I have nine different exercises here. So the first one, it just goes through the blues form, jazz blues form, and it's an F blues. So the first one, all we do is play the root on all the changes. The second one, we go through the root and fifth, kind of like what I did on that Gloria Stefan gig. Third one, we add the third. So it's just root, third, fifth, third, root, third, fifth, third, root, third, fifth. Still boring bass line. And then the fourth one, we start to add chromatic tones. So if my first chord is F7, and then the next bar, my next chord is B flat seven, I'll go F, 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 half step below to A, and then up to B flat. Chromatic up, chromatic up, and practice those chromatic leaning tones. And then I'll do the same thing from above. And work those chromatic leading tones. Then from there, um, I have a fully chromatic line. So I'll go root, third, work up chromatic to the next chord, work up chromatic to the next chord. So there's a bunch of different variations on things that I will work on. And then I go into a little bit of the two feel. Right? Because if you're just playing straight quarter notes the whole time, especially if you're playing in a, in a combo setting, doing standards, it just gets to be a little monotonous. Um, so go through two feel, and at the very end, to kind of make your own bass line. So it, you, can, you can hit a practice track online and play along with this. The apps are great because you can just zero out the bass part. Um, but this is a little excerpt from the course, and this is, the course is four weeks long. So it's like a ton of material. It's 50 bucks if you're interested. And uh, yeah, that's what's up. Any other questions? When is the course? Uh, so it's, it's like work at your own pleasure whenever you want. 
I, I started it in 2020 because I was freaking out that my career was over and I had nothing left with my life. I'm like, I don't know what to do anymore. So I'm like, I, I got to do something online. And then I did the online course and it was really great and everybody loved it. And then like by the end of 2020, everybody's like, I don't want to do any online learning ever again. I'm like, oh crap. All right, it's on sale now. So uh, if anybody's interested in the course. Um, but yeah, it's, so it's work at your own pace. It's, it's four weeks long, but it's basically like five days, five days, five days. I have some people that take five months and some people that do it like really quick because they're, they're speed demons. Let's play another one. Play another one? Let's play. All right, let's play one out. Um,
afternoon. I guess it's still afternoon. Um, just a couple announcements before we start, if you haven't already heard them five or six times. Uh, so we, if you haven't registered, registered yet, please go to UnitedStatesArmyBand.com, USArmyBand.com, and register for the conference. It just helps us track numbers. It helps us uh, promote our product for next year. So if you haven't done that, please go do so. Um, after your rehearsal starts at 1800, so if you are an active duty uh, reserve, if you are a military service member and you want to play an AFTI, rehearsal will be right here at 1800. Exhibits start tomorrow at uh, 1200, so we hope that everyone is, uh, is able to go out and um, try some instruments and buy, uh, support our vendors, buy some music, mouthpieces, whatever, whatever you have, whatever you want. Um, we have a very special group. Uh, up next, the Navy Band Tubi Euphonium Quartet is internationally recognized as a driving force in low brass music and as one of the premier ensembles of its kind. Formed in 1985, this unique group has thrilled audiences with arrangements of popular melodies and classical transcriptions. Directed by Chief Musician Philip Eberly, the quartet also includes Chief Musician James Hicks, Chief Musician Bryce Edwards, and are joined today by musician first class John Meg Magana. The Navy Band to be phoneme quartet.
Tennessee, and I'm Chief Philip Beverly from Shillington, Pennsylvania. Um, we started with Celestial Sweep by Stephen Bullo, um, Three Movements, uh, Eclipse, <coughs> Canzone Lunaire, and the last one is uh, just playing from the title. That's why I should have memorized this a little bit better. Solar, Solar Plexus! Plexus. That's right. <laughs> that was a fast one. So it's very fun. Uh, next, we'll play a piece by Omar Thomas called Emma Catherine. Uh, he wrote it for his tuba, tuba or trombone professor, 
Uh, James Madison, who uh, just had a baby, um, Emma Catherine is his daughter, and he wrote the piece to celebrate her. Uh, we're going to play an arrangement for a quartet written uh, and commissioned by the Georgia Tuli Phonium Quartet.
Once again, I'm Bryce. I play bird. It's a pleasure to meet you guys. So the next picture playing is uh, is from a guy I went to school with. His name is Ben McMillan. Ben, if you're watching, I don't like this piece. He wrote this piece called Goldberg's Machine. You guys know what Goldberg's Machine is? There's a cartoonist, if you don't know, named Rube Goldberg, who was famous for writing crazy contraptions that did really simple tasks. So if you can imagine this with this piece, Really ridiculous meter changes, all sorts of weird stuff, and to what end? And as Ben says, but what does it actually do? Goldberg's machine.
great event, um, having us and, and inviting us to play. Um, it's always great to get this group together. We have a lot of fun. Um, and so having an opportunity to perform for, for you is, is wonderful for us. Um, so last, we're going to go back to one of our old war horses here at, at the Navy Band. Um, Ralph Martino was a staff arranger and composer for the band. Uh, and in 1990, the quartet played at iTech in Japan, and he wrote the fantasy for the group to premiere. Uh, so this is a, a piece we've played quite often. Um, we've played it at the conference many times here, and uh, we'd like to share it with you one more time. So thank you for having us again. Um, uh, here is Ralph Martino's fantasy. Thank you. 
portion of this hour, we have the Volunteer Brass Quintet. They are an honors brass quintet at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. This ensemble performs regularly on and off campus and visits many high school, uh, high school programs. The VBQ is coached in rotation by the brass faculty at UTK and is being coached right now currently by Alexander Lappins for the 2022-2023 academic year. So without further ado, please help me welcome the Volunteer Brass Quintet. because that's much shorter and easier to say. Um, we're from the University of Tennessee, and we're being coached by the lovely Dr. Lappins this year, which is how we were able to get here for you today. Um, we're going to start the program off with Raise the Roof by Gwyneth Walker, which, while we do get some nice, fun brass quintet sounds, we also hear a couple other non-traditional brass sounds, and also, I um, almost forgot to mention that this quintet is an honors quintet at UT, and it's, uh, we're all on scholarship, which is endowed by the tuba legend Jim Self, so thank you to Jim Self, and hopefully you all enjoy the exciting music we have for you today. Thank you.
Thank you all so much. Again, we are thrilled to be here. Um, if you couldn't tell, this is my first tuba euphonium uh, conference experience. And um, for one, it's um, without saying that it's, it's easy to acknowledge just the amount of passion and, and the meaning that this conference means to everybody. Um, and so for the next piece on our program, we decided to program something of that sort. Um, this quintet has been playing this piece for a while now. Um, and it's come to mean something to us, not just because it has features the horn, um, but because um, it features lots of lyricism and lots of um, soaring melodies over top. Um, and the piece is Quintet by Michael Kamen, um, popular, um, popular music composer. Um, but this was one of his last um, concert pieces uh, written for the Canadian brass. Um, so please enjoy Quintet by Michael Kamen.
everyone. Thank you so much um, for attending our recital. We're really excited to be here. Um, so our next piece on the program is Hopscotch um, featuring our tubist, AJ Johnson. Um, we felt it was very appropriate uh, because we're at Tubo Euphonium Workshop and it's really a great pleasure to have AJ in our group. Um, we all love having him. Um, he's a great colleague and um, a quick note about the piece, Hopscotch, written by Brian Balmages, um, mostly known for his band compositions. Um, we decided to play this piece um, for the workshop, and um, really fun to play. Reminds us of little kids playing games um, like Hopscotch or skipping, dancing, and such. Um, we hope you enjoy Hopscotch by Brian Balmages. Thank you. 
so much again for having us out here. Uh, we can't thank you enough for even uh, letting us onto the base with only one tubist in the car uh, <laughs> and this uh, slide euphonium. Um, uh, have to give a huge shout out to our coach, Dr. Lappins. He's, uh, he's here with us. His recital is tomorrow. Uh, could not have done this without him. He set it up and has been coaching us this year. It's been a really rewarding experience to work with him and to work with the rest of the quintet. Um, we have one more piece for you. Uh, it's called Ricochet by Carrie Turner. Um, another sort of tuba feature, but uh, don't worry, we'll all be ricocheting around right along with him. Uh, but another chance to hear, hear AJ shine here. Um, yeah, thank you all again for having us out. Uh, once again, uh, it is an honors quintet endowed by Jim Self, I'm sure. Don't need to explain who that is, uh, tuba legend out there. Um, please enjoy Ricochet by Carrie Turner. Thanks.
Thank you. 
Thank you.